So today I'd just like to give an, a, an overview of the vanadium redox flow battery. It's past where we are now and hopefully a little bit about the future, where, where we see the future going. Um, just for those people who don't know much about flow batteries, a, a brief introduction. A flow battery is different from a conventional battery in that it uses solutions to store energy. So we have um, uh, two components. I'm just trying to see. Yeah, fine. Yeah, two components, a cell stack, which is where the energy conversion takes place and where the kilowatt, kilowatts, the power is actually generated, and two tanks, which contain two different solutions, a positive and a negative half cell solution, which contains wh where the energy is actually stored. So the size of the cell stacks determines how much power you can generate. Uh, so it's like the engine. And the size of the tanks is, is, determines how long you can generate that power for. So it's like the size of your tanks in your car. Uh, determines the, It's the fuel, pretty much. But unlike normal fuel, fuel cells or other types of fuels or generators, that fuel, you don't burn it. You can just reuse it over and over again hundreds of thousands of times by charging and, and discharging over and over again. So there are different types of flow batteries. There are what we call uh, redox flow batteries where the solutions are just uh, involve soluble species where nothing comes out of solution or we don't have any plating. But there's also a different type of flow battery like the zinc bromine battery where you, actually, where you plate out zinc at the negative electrode. So it's a little bit different in the way it operates. Uh, different types of flow batteries, uh, some examples, zinc bromine, as I mentioned, the all vanadium redox battery, which we developed, the sulfur bromide, iron chromium. The iron chromium was the very first battery that was a uh, redox flow battery developed by NASA. Um, so today I'll be talking mainly about the UNSW, the University of New South Wales, vanadium redox flow battery, which uses a vanadium 2-3 couple in the negative half cell and a vanadium 4-5 couple in the positive half cell. In other words, we have, the, and the beauty of vanadium is that it exists in many different forms, where, it, where you can take away one electron at a time and form a different species. And by cu coupling those species on the negative and the positive side and just exchanging an electron from one of the vanadium ions to the other vanadium ions, we just charge and discharge continuously. So all we're doing is exchanging a vanadium ion from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. Some of the technical, the technical benefits. Um, the reason the iron chromium battery didn't go very far was because it had two different elements uh, in each half cell. So when you're trying to separate two solutions with different elements with a membrane, it's very hard for the membrane to stop the solutions from mixing. So eventually they, they mix together and they contaminate each other. But by using the same element on both sides, and that's, the beauty, as I said, the beauty of vanadium is it, can exist in, it exists in many different oxidation states. So it has, it can, by taking away two electrons, you produce v, V2, which is this violet color. Take away an extra electron, you produce V3, which is green. Uh, an extra electron you remove, you produce V4, which is this blue color. And one further electron, you produce V5, which is a yellow color. So by changing the number of electrons around the vanadium ions, you get all these different colors of solution. And that's why, in fact, they call it after Vanadis, the Scandinavian goddess of beauty. That's where the vanadium, the word for vanadium comes from, because of the beautiful colors of the vanadium solutions. And as a, 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 as a woman, I love, <laughs> I love colorful things. And, and, and that's the beauty of vanadium working all these years. It keeps you, it's very interesting uh, system to work with. Uh, so because the solutions don't contaminate each other, but even if the ions move across the membrane, they just stay as vanadium, and you just keep on re reforming them each time and to the right oxidation, and therefore they have an indefinite life, so you don't have to worry about expensive uh, reprocessing costs uh, of any wastes. Um, also, vanadium is a lot of people, because they haven't heard of vanadium, they think it's a very rare material. But in fact, as we've heard already, there's, vanadium is quite plentiful. There's a lot of vanadium in the Earth's crust, but it's trying to make sure that we can process it and produce it at the, economically and at the, for the quantities that we're going to re require. Um, so another thing, uh, another important benefit of flow batteries is that because the capacity, in other words, how many hours of energy we can store is determined by the volume of our solutions. As we increase the number of hours of storage, the cost per kilowatt hour drops off dramatically because all we're doing in order to add more energy storage time or storage capacity, we just add more solution rather than building more and more batteries. And therefore, each in the incremental cost of the extra energy is very small, so the cost per kilowatt hour drops off very very quickly. And that's why redox flow batteries are very are finding 
a very important application in areas where you need more than four hours of storage because compared to the cost of other types of batteries, for those types of applications, the cost per kilowatt hour is very, very small compared to lithium ion batteries or other types of batteries, for example, because all you're adding is extra solution and that cost is very, very small in comparison. Right, so just a little bit of a history of the vanadium battery. We invented it back, started it back in 1984-85, filed the first patent in 1986 at the University of New South Wales. Very early on, in 1993-90, uh, we actually, the university licensed the technology to a Thai company and also to Mitsubishi Chemicals and one of their uh, power stations in Japan. And, and very quickly, uh, they started putting in quite a lot of investment and getting a lot of money from the, the Japanese government. And they started installing quite large demonstration systems back in the, in the, from the mid-1990s to uh, for, for the next 10 years. In 1998, the university sold the patents to an Australian company called Pinnacle VRB, uh, who then granted a license to Sumitomo, another very large Japanese company, which uh, has been developing the vanadium battery quite um, aggressively. In 2001, the uh, Canadian company, VRB Power, it was actually set up by an Australian company uh, in Canada. They acquired control of Pinnacle and the original vanadium battery patents. But in 2006, the basic patent expired. Now, up to that point, there was very little, uh, there were uh, uh, restrictions on other, the uh, commercialization by other companies because this basic patent stopped other people from working on vanadium batteries. But after 2006, when the basic patent expired, we saw many other companies starting to get into the vanadium redox flow battery and uh, an, ex an expansion in its development. And in 2008, unfortunately, VRB Power um, suffered during the financial crisis and they had to sell all their assets off and Prudent Energy, a Chinese-based company, acquired those, um, that technology, including the university's patents. So over the years, we've been developing a lot of the basic science and the materials and uh, the understanding of vanadium batteries, but we've also done quite a lot in the cell design, the materials, uh, stack design, construction, and these just examples of some of the stacks, uh, the very first flow uh, little flow cell that we built in 1985. And to our surprise, we were able to get from 80% efficiency in our small cell, we were able to get 80% energy efficiency as soon as we scaled it up. And that was a very exciting um, discovery that we made, that, you, that scaling up, that you don't lose much efficiency with scaling up. These are some of the early demonstration projects at the university. We were funded in the mid-1990s by our defence department to evaluate the potential for using vanadium batteries in submarines, and we've, we successfully completed a, uh, this project. We, together with the Thai licensee, we installed a vanadium battery in this uh, solar, powered, uh, solar house in Thailand. We installed a vanadium battery in a golf cart, just to show that you can actually drive around and uh, potential for electric vehicles. Again, funded, this was funded by our, um, our energy, Department of Energy. Oops. And then during that, during that time, we saw a lot of uh, developments in Japan moving forward with the technology. Uh, Sumitomo started in, to install both small-scale and large-scale systems in office buildings. And this is a, a photograph of uh, an installation in one office building. But in, they also installed a 2-megawatt vanadium battery in a semiconductor factory in Tokyo. And during that time, because of the lightning strikes that occurred at that time, which would have led to lost production capacity, because every time there's a lightning strike, all the machines shut down and you have to start up again, they found that they were able to have a, there was a payback period of six months just from the avoided uh, production losses during power failures during that time. Uh, very early on again, in the mid-1990s, uh, both Sumitomo here and Kashima Kita and Mitsubishi Chemicals built these load leveling batteries. Load leveling is where you put a, a battery at a power station and you use the off-peak electricity at night time which is quite cheap, to charge up the batteries, and then you use that uh, energy during the daytime, during the peak, to meet the peak demands. And it avoids, when you do load levelling, or you have energy storage for load levelling, it avoids the need to build extra power stations to meet the extra peak demand, which often occurs only if, over a few hours during the daytime. About 2005, they, uh, Sumitomo installed a vanadium battery, a, a four megawatt, six megawatt hour vanadium battery, 
at a power station in Hokkaido. And during the three-year uh, project, they operated over 200,000 cycles. And that's something that's just very, very exciting because as, as I think Terry mentioned, that uh, some batteries, you charge them, and after about 100 cycles, they die. And, and so even, it doesn't matter how cheap they are, if they die after 100 cycles, it's, the, 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 each cycle has cost you a lot of money. But if, if these batteries can last 200,000 cycles, it shows you that you can actually, uh, uh, the, the, the actual cost of the energy that you're generating is, can be quite low. Right, so why, people always ask me, so we started in 1985, why has it taken so long for the vanadium battery to get to the market? And so many people have been waiting for years and following the development of, at the university and, and wanting to know what's, why has it, has it been so slow? So I've sort of sat down on many times and tried to understand what's been, what, what, what are the factors that have been impeding to date the commercialization of flow batteries. And it's not just flow batteries, it's all energy storage technologies. It's, the flow battery is only one energy storage technology has, that's been sitting back waiting for the market to develop. Back in, 19, in the mid 1980s when we started working on the vanadium battery, there was this projection that one day in the future we're going to need energy storage for renewables. We've been waiting for the renewables to come on board. Now we see a lot of renewables coming on board, but this, the market for storage didn't grow, uh, didn't grow in parallel because unfortunately for many years the renewable industry has been trying to distance itself from the need to store energy because they wanted to be able to get the government funding, government subsidies to be able to grow their industry at, without the need for storage, which was an extra cost for, for renewable energy. So they always proposed that, to, uh, that gr the grid was the storage. You don't need to have storage because the grid provides storage. But that works, works up to a certain point. And so, uh, and in fact, over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a huge increase in renewables on the grid, and, but it's, the, it's the, the wind developers or the solar farms aren't the ones who suffer. It's the utilities who experience the problems because the wind could be blowing now, 10 minutes later, the wind's not blowing. And if you've got a huge capacity, uh, if a lot of your power is being generated from a wind farm and all of a sudden the wind stops blowing, you can lose half of your generating capacity and the load will suffer. So it's not their problem. The utilities have to, have to suffer uh, and find a solution. But now as we see that the increase in, in renewables is causing huge disruption and uh, instability to the grid, the utilities are now starting to demand and realise that they need to have storage to stabilise the grid. So this is one of the um, factors that I've, which, which in fact I, which is the market. It's the it's taken quite a while for for the market to to mature, and part of it was due to the fact that the renewable energy industry is being it was quite fragmented, and they didn't sort of project come forward as a as a unified industry, um, unfortunately. But there've also been other factors. First, as I mentioned before, there was a patent that um, prevented other people from using or developing vanadium batteries until 2006. Once that expired, then, then we've seen a huge explosion in the number of researchers developing and researching vanadium batteries and government, government funding now coming into vanadium batteries in North America, which has really stimulated the interest in vanadium batteries around the world. But, the, but of course, economic factors, because with, as with all new technologies, it, it takes a while to get the, the um, manufacturing volumes to be able to get the prices down. And if you're only producing small quantities of any new, new product, the cost per, for each of those products is going to be relatively high at the beginning. And that's why, in fact, at the beginning, even with uh, photovoltaic solar cells, wind turbines were very expensive. But because of the, the government subsidies, which allowed them to uh, get into the market with, um, with subsidies, they were able to increase the production capacity, bring the cost down, and now we're sort of start, now starting to see real uh, cost reductions in, in each of those sec uh, seg sectors. How, unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet for energy storage. And we haven't sort of seen the same level of government support that has, is needed to get a new product to the market and get, them, get it into the market while the vo production volumes increase to bring the cost down. So, so with increased mass, with mass production economies of scale, as we start to see more producers coming in, the, all the component costs will come down. So it's not just manufacturing the battery. Each component uh, will have to come down in cost. And that only happens when you increase the volume uh, of, for example, membranes, the electrode materials, the electrolyte, and so on. 
Another very important thing, of course, is the vanadium electrolyte and the vanadium cost itself. And over the years, we've seen, as Terry have shown, has shown us, we've seen a huge instability in the, in the price of vanadium. And every time some companies were just on the verge of getting to the market, the vanadium price would shoot up. Investors would get scared. They'd say, well, vanadium batteries are not economical. How can you, how can you uh, get into the market when the price of vanadium is $25 a, a pound? And of course, the interest falls away. So the instability of the vanadium price has been a major issue that has slowed down the development of the vanadium battery in particular. But as I said before, all energy storage technologies have, have taken a while to get to the market anyway. Another, another thing, of course, is it's, um, at the moment, because of, because of low production volumes, most of the assembly of the batteries is fairly manual. So you need a lot, there's a lot of labor cost involved. So only c c countries such as China and India, where the production costs are quite low, labor costs are quite low, we can sort of get to an economically uh, viable production price for batteries. But as we see, um, automated production and assembly lines coming in, coming in, then we hopefully will be able to see production in in America, in Europe as well. Now, the other very important factor is polit the political factors. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've seen very high feed-in tariff rates for renewable energies, uh, which have, have been very good for the wind, uh, the, the wind uh, turbine manufacturers and the, and the PV, solar cell manufacturers, but that's been to the detriment of the energy storage because, because of, the const of these feed-in uh, feed tariffs, uh, energy producers using wind, uh, uh, wind, wind, um, wind energy producers or solar energy producers were guaranteed a feed-in price for their electricity, whether the, whether the electricity was being delivered during peak times or during off-peak times. I mean, I remember in Europe many years ago, a lot of people used to be very angry when they'd see, uh, in Germany, when they'd see the wind turbines turning because they knew that as soon as the wind is turning, they were paying a lot of money. The, the, the government and therefore the ta taxpayer was paying a lot of money for that wind, even though it, was, it might have been during the night time when no one was really needing it. Um, so, th so that was a de detriment to the energy storage industry, unfortunately. But, but as we've said, as, as grid stability problems now associated with increased renewable energy have now emerged, the, new, the need for energy storage has finally been acknowledged by everybody.